is more of a general education uh, capstone. So um, it's just kind of bringing together a lot of the ideas of, um, in, in uh, reading, writing, and presenting that we've uh, had in the past four years. Yeah. Very good. And of course, their professor, Dr. Ivory Lyons, who will be uh, conducting worship for us today. Where's that? Welcome. And, mm -hmm. and Welcome. this is our class. <laughs> it's it, it's expandable. Sometimes we have more. Sometimes we have. All right. Oh, many churches are like that. So, <laughs> with the with the magic snow, <laughs> just, just showed up. Okay. And their the, their topic is uh, negotiating diversity. Correct. Yes. All right. Uh, Go ahead. That's fine. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. As as Shirley said, my name is Andrew. Um, I've, I've, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, uh, diversity in, in race and culture today. Um, I had heard that you guys are talking a little bit about um, religious diversity. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at the different religions the past few weeks, and we figured we could. Tie that tie that into looking at diversity within culture. Um, the first thing that I wanted to do is kind of give a little bit of background to look at the history of the modern idea of race. So, the modern idea of race doesn't go back as far as some people would would assume. Really, it didn't start until European colonialism and uh, meeting of Native Americans. Um, the treatment of Native Americans uh, as, as other or as, as less really started this modern idea of, of race. And um, when, when the uh, first European uh, colonists came over, uh, some, some were very wealthy and they you know, controlled land and they, they uh, made businesses. Others didn't have the money to come over, so they came over as indentured servants. Um, both uh, whites and blacks came over as indentured servants, and they were treated very similarly. Um, and they didn't feel that they were being treated fairly in all cases. So this led to groups of, of whites and blacks getting together and running away, uh, causing revolts, um, a, lot of, a lot of things that these wealthy individuals really didn't want because if, you, if your workforce is revolting on you, that means you have to do the work and they didn't want to do that. Um, so they came up with this plan. They were, they were gonna find something in common with part of this group. And the one thing that they settled on was skin color. So they decided that they were going to take skin color into consideration and say, look, you guys are like us. Um, and since you're like us, we're going to give you a little bit of land. We're going to give you a little bit of freedom, and we're going to we're going to you know help you get in on this this great thing that we have going. Um, you just have to make sure that you make sure the other the other group that isn't like us doesn't get what we have. And this was extremely effective, um, creating an in group and an out group. And if you were part of that in group, you didn't want to risk being cast out so you would stay and work with that in group and if you were part of the out group you really didn't have a say in what was going on. Um, so this kind of leads to this modern idea of race and of uh, the, the rising idea of white being superior. Um, in, in the Civil War, um, obviously worst war in American history, um, split the country in two over the idea of slavery. Um, we all know that the North, the North won the Civil War, and uh, a lot of people thought that was going to be it. That was, that was going to release slaves, and then we were going to see equality. But instead, we saw um, over 100 years of just overt racism and prejudice carried out against these, this group of ex-slaves and their, um, their children and so on. And it isn't, it isn't until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s until, or that, that we start to see um, real progress in, in, this, in the race relations of um, this in-group and this out-group of whites and blacks. 
and um, the civil rights movement did make huge steps in in uh, bringing about uh, more voter equal voting equality, more uh, job job equality, uh, and a lot of the, the basic things you think of as you know things you want equality in. Um, but it didn't get us all the way there, and uh, our our third group member who. Um, unfortunately has come down with the flu today. She was going to talk about uh, modern society and race a little bit, and I'm going to try and cover her section as best I can. Um, <laughs> so as we're moving into modern society, we're no longer seeing this horrible or overt racism with the KKK and, and lynchings and just horrible, horrible things like that. But we are still seeing some holdovers from, from this system. And uh, these, these can take uh, many forms. Um, one form they can take is microaggressions, which are um, comments made, uh, feelings, uh, things said that taken at face value, each individual thing isn't, isn't really that serious of a thing said, but as they continue to stack over and over and over again, it's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back idea. Um, so, you know, an example of microaggression would be uh, someone making a comment about how uh, women should, you know, belong in the kitchen and they don't need a career or something like that. Like, uh, one comment that it, on its own doesn't really change too much about how the world works, but when, when stacked over and over and over and repeated, it can become a very serious thing. Um, another idea uh, that we talk about in the modern I idea of race relations is white privilege, which is the inherent um, advantages that that you have just by being white. Um, for example, I know that almost anywhere that I go, I will just be looked upon as, as normal and I will never be looked upon as an outsider in our society. Um, I'll, I'll have the ability to see people like me succeeding and on television and portrayed in all sorts of different ways. Um, Whereas someone of a different race or ethnicity might not have some of those advantages. Um, and uh, finally, she was going to talk a little bit about uh, the genetic basis for race. And one of, the, one of the most interesting things that I thought we learned in our class was there really isn't a genetic basis for race. Um, so they did some studies and they found out uh, that there's no real correlation between genetics and race. There's uh, less diversity among human beings than there is amongst most other species of animals. And uh, most of that, that diversity is within your own race. So for example, um, myself and Bobby here look very similar. We're similar heights, both brown hair, both Caucasian. Um, but in fact, I may have more in common genetically with Dr. Lyons than I do with uh, <laughs> that I do with Bobby, um, just just because of how little of a factor genetics actually plays in um, in race. Um, and finally, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby. Uh, he's going to discuss a little bit about how you can use the white privilege that you have uh, to help. Um, help create more equality in our society. Thank you. <clears throat> well, first I'm going to start with, like, what is white privilege? I mean, it's a social privilege law, and uh, I found a formal definition of it. White privilege is a set of advantages and or immunities that white people benefit on a daily basis, beyond those common to all others. White privilege can exist without white people's conscious knowledge of its presence, and it helps to maintain the racial hierarchy in this country. I like this definition. Uh, I like this definition because, um, like, even though, like, I myself never heard of white privilege and was never aware of it for this class, and like, that's like, and that's the point. Like, it can still exist even without your conscious knowledge of it. And to expand upon that definition a little bit, it's uh, to give white persons special freedom or immunity from some liability or burden to which non-white persons are not subject, or to exempt white people. Uh, for now, I'll move to a few examples of everyday life that you may never have even thought about that are actually examples of white privilege. 
For example, uh, you don't feel pressure to represent your race. If, um, if a white person makes a mistake, nobody attributes to their race that they can't do it because they're white and they, that's why they messed up. Uh, most beauty project uh, products, bandages, things of that nature are geared towards your skin color and all that. You can go into a pharmacy, find something of skin tone, and it will match your skin tone. Um, the media is geared towards you. You can turn on TV any day of the week and you most likely see white people represented in a positive light. You'll see them succeeding, which uh, leads you to believe that you truth can su succeed. And uh, you'll never see your culture just produced to a stereotype, which uh, for people of color make, makes them feel invisible and uh, I have mainstream culture. A fourth example, uh, the police and criminal justice system tends to benefit white people more than it does people of color or Latinos. Uh, just a few facts I found. In New York City between 2005 and 2008, 80% of New York Police uh, Department stops were African Americans and Latinos, while only 10% of these were whites. So as you can see, there's a big discrepancy here. Uh, under the New York Police Department's Stop and Frisk program, and every year since 2009, 87% of those stops and frisks were African American and Latino. Uh, and Switching from New York to California. In a California study, the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, found that African Americans were three times as more likely to be stopped than a, than a white person. And so, moving from that to like the white privilege movement, like the people who like they really start this movement, that they're kind of at the forefront, they really push for it. Uh, the first guy, um, they began, because, well, well, what is American, they, white Americans became aware of their white privilege, and they recognized the injustice with this privilege and decided it wasn't fair that they had these privileges that they did nothing to earn. And so they, they wanted to use these to help people of color, to help benefit them. Uh, first one would be Tim Wise. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of him or not, but uh, he's uh, done many speeches. Uh, we've watched a couple of videos in class on him. And he just, he really pushes, uh, he uh, lists all kinds of facts uh, of like, the discrepancies between the whites and the people of color. Uh, he's written several books, a um, few of them, uh, White Like Me, Reflections on Race from a Privileged Son, and his most recent one, which would be Under the Affluent, Shaming the Poor, Praising the Rich, and Sacrificing the Future of America. Uh, he's been featured in several documentaries that I stated, we watched a few of them in class. Um, <coughs> Uh, one, including one, White Like Me, race, Racism and White Privilege in America. And he regularly appears on CNN and NBC to discuss race, race issues and was re uh, featured on a 2020 segment in 2007. Uh, another uh, fellow White Privilege member would be Paul C. Gorski. He founded the Ed Change Movement. Uh, he's associate professor at George Mason University. And he states that his goal is continual transformation toward Equality, justice within himself, communities, schools, and within his society. Uh, he's worked with many schools, colleges, universities, as stated. Um, he works to help build organizations to help build the policies and literacies necessary to authenticate, authenticate diversity and equality efforts. Uh, another uh, white privilege member would be Peggy McIntosh. She actually wrote an article called White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, which we have read multiple times in class. We refer to it all the time to good uh, indication of white privilege and with several good examples. Uh, she's a former director of the Westlake Center for Women. She's the founder of the National Seed Project, which um, helps teachers create their own year-long school-based seminars for teaching diversity in their classes and ways of approaching the subject. And so finally, I went with, like, now that you know a little bit about what your white privilege is and some common examples of it, what can you do to help? One of the most important ones is just educate yourself about it, as we're doing right now. Um, just know a few examples of it, what it is, how it affects people of color, how it affects you. Um, have conversations with other people about white privilege and racism. Most white people tend to feel uncomfortable when you bring up the topic of race and racism, and they tend, they tend to avoid the subject. But um, it's a lot easier for them to start the conversation than it is for people of color. Um, just. Just a side note, uh, just have facts handy with uh, handy so you can uh, disprove anybody that tries, like, has like, a racial bias that tries to state facts that are inaccurate. For example, that, that you know if you're white, you're actually more than 40% more likely to receive a private scholarship than if you're not white. So if you hear friends and family talking about somebody that didn't get a scholarship because uh, 
they were the people, uh, person of color took their spot, uh, how many statistics can help to uh, disprove these uh, theories? A fourth one, amplify the voices of people of color talk about race, racism, and white privilege on social media. As I said, one of the best ways to call uh, attention to age racial and inequalities is by listening to the voices of people of color and sharing their experiences. Cause people are often more likely to listen to a white person speak about these issues than they would a person of color because they would just think that they were whining and complaining. Uh, be assertive about challenging racism in your community or workplace. As I said, uh, white people, that uh, they can make more of a difference. And it's easier for them to challenge uh, racism in these scenarios than it would be for a person of color to do so. And then, that said, just sometimes being, being supportive of these people who are voicing their opinions as people of color uh, can really mean a lot to them. Uh, being an observed bystander, don't just observe racially uh, charged bias. Uh, say something about it. Step up. Make a statement about it. Uh, disprove them if you can. Uh, just another small side note. Support businesses owned by people of color. Uh, as history has shown us, uh, white people tend to have more of the money in the United States. And to put that benefit by help, helping people with, of color would really mean a lot. Uh, an eighth one would be fighting for the rights of this voting of people of color. First of all, because as long as people of color have had the right to vote, there have always been people who, who try to stop them through gerrymandering, voter intimidation, and other such acts. And believe it or not, many of these practices still uh, continue today. And the outcome of local elections often directly impacts these people of color. So doing what you can to help is what really mean a lot. And finally, just get involved with organizations doing anti-racism work or just uh, support them. Donate money, donate your time where you can. Uh, so, uh, for example, even donating $5 a month to an organization that's working with change can make a huge difference. All right. Um, at this time, we would like to turn it over to you guys, see if you guys have any questions or uh, things that you guys would like to talk about. I wondered if you have any of the three of you had done, done in a study of advertising and and uh, to see, I think there are maybe more people of color in ads now, but I haven't really gone into it to, to see if that's true. Yeah, um, I, I don't think any of us have looked into that specifically, but that's definitely a very interesting thing that I would, I would uh, love to look into. Um, yeah, it's uh, crazy that all ads TV ads should be white people because mm -hmm. people of color are spending money too. Yeah, this is one of those things you never think of until it's not too late. I, I, I may want to draw the students' attention to remember the video where um, Tim Wise was talking about, he went to talk about diversity to some police officers? Yes. He might explain explain that. Um, so Tim Wise, who Bobby had uh, spoke about it in, in his part of our presentation, um, he he came in to talk, or he, he frequently comes in to talk to groups of police officers um, for diversity training seminars. And the first question he always asks when he walks in is, um, if you see a young African American male driving a very nice car, what do you think? And almost every single time, without fail, white and black officers will respond, drug dealer. Almost without fail. When he asks the same question phrased slightly differently, what, what do you think when you see a young white male driving a very nice car, what do you think? And the, the response is almost without fail, rich dad bought it for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and as, as Tim Wise said, um, within the first two questions of his seminar, everyone in the room has outed themselves as a racist. And it's these type of um, societal biases that, that we can use our white privilege to try and change and try and um, get, get a more positive dialogue going. Uh, an example of what you were talking about 
I was a teacher in Brexville, Ohio, which is a very white community. Uh, there was a teacher's strike, and the uh, Ohio Education Association sent us uh, someone to help negotiate because we were having trouble getting things settled. And the fellow they sent was black. Uh, the meeting went on, the, the group that he was meeting with went on very late and he was driving around Brooksville Square to go to the nearest motel like at one o'clock in the morning. The police stopped him. Of course, he had a fairly good car. Police stopped him. He out of the car with his hands up over the top just because he was a black man driving through this community. You know, and those stories are, are far, far too common. Um, I, every, every single person of color, especially um, African-American males, has, has a similar story to, to share. I know Dr. Lyons has shared several stories similar to that with us, as well as some of the other students in our class. Um, thank you. Has your class talked at all about the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, in class, we've touched on it a little bit. Um, there, there was a uh, panel at the school um, that discussed it in more depth. Uh, uh, a few weeks ago at, um, that I attended. Um, do you, what is the goal of the group? Um, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. um, from what I what I've gathered, the goal of the group is to just support the idea that Black lives do matter in a country that has historically mm -hmm. said they don't. Um, Bobby, do you have anything to add to that? Or? And we watched a video similar to this uh, of the of the man who started the Black Lives Movement. And basically what Andrew said is just to draw attention to the injustice that's taking, taking place against black people and kind of encouraging white people to make a change, to recognize it and help make a change. Um, I know uh, there's been a lot of discussion about well, it shouldn't be the Black Lives Matter movement, it should be the All Lives Matter mm -hmm. movement. And um, that's kind of minimizing what they're trying to say. They're, uh, I, I don't remember who, who had said it, but someone at the panel had said, um, it's not saying other lives don't matter, it's saying black lives also matter. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I just, I didn't know if it had come out of the, the number of police shootings of young black people or, yeah, I, uh, I think it, you know, which of course I think lots of attention to injustice. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thank you. This church a number of years ago had an associate pastor who's black, he's from Ghana. And uh, that, I mean, I've always been intrigued by people that were, some assumptions or stereotypes might be applied to, to blacks that maybe when you're not from another nation, that it's a different, this was a delightful person that we all love dearly and uh, I just wondered how much he would feel about the distinction between being black American and black from another country. Yeah, um, I, I, find, I find that very interesting as well. Um, I, I don't know that I've looked into that at all. Um, Bobby, have you looked into that? Um, not much. I really haven't kind of studied that like, that angle at all, so I'm really not too sure. Um, that's, that's a very, uh, very interesting point that you bring up, though. Thank you. Now that that pastor's uh, uh, pastor uh, Kale. Kale. Yeah, yeah, you know he's he's yeah. doing pretty well. I still keep track of him on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. I just talked to him the other day. Yeah. Oh, good, good. <coughs> um, does anyone else have any other questions? Yes. I'm just going to say I want your opinion on. I believe that race relations are worse now than they've been for a long, long time, and I was just wondering what. Either one of you fellows or your classmates think of, um, of that. My personal opinion is that race relations aren't any worse than they've been. They're just being discussed more. So they they are exactly as they have been. We're just hearing more about it as um, movements such as the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. movement and um, some of some of the injustices that we've been hearing about are are coming 
to light and being expressed in the media. Uh, Bob, do you have an opinion? Well, like you said, it's kind of pretty much just that, that people are more willing to listen to them now, they're being brought to light. And like the Black Lives Matter, like the injustices, they're being brought to light and they're asking why, why is it like this, why is it set up like this, and what can we do to change it? Um, does that answer your question? Right. Um, anyone else? Me, I'm, we keep looking for black here, but there's so many, I'm reading a book right now called The Bonfire of the Vanities that I wrote with, and it's about New York in the 80s, and, and we think that America is a great melting pot, every time together, but there are, in city, in big cities like that, it's very segregated by the Italians, by the, by the Jewish people, they, they, all these things are, there's so much discrimination on those things, who can belong to what clubs, who can do things, and it's, uh, it's so, it's, it's, we, I, I'm sort of confused by the, the big melting pot versus you're Italian, you, this is what you do, you're, you're this, you that, and so it's, it sort of goes against being a melting pot, because especially in Vegas, we're not aware of it now, I don't know how it was, I would guess maybe a long time ago on Alliance, maybe certain, certain international or nationalities were discriminated against, I don't know. George's father grew up in New York City, and he said, and he was born in 1892, and in his lifetime as a child there, he saw an Irishman hanging from a lamppost. So it, that was the time, I guess, when the Irish were very much discriminated against. I think it's interesting that uh, the number of ethnic groups are li arriving in our country and there is a desire I'm sure as an alien in this country you seek your own kind or you seek your own friends or you seek the people you can speak the same language with and uh, for instance there's a large number of oh, I'm confused which one of the African groups one of the African countries a large group in the Minneapolis area they have uh, you know, saw mm -hmm. that area because of other people living there. And I think this has happened in all of our large cities, whether it's Irish or Italian or uh, people from Ethiopia. Yeah. They um, seem to be somewhat together. And that, that um, as, as we've found as we've been going through this class, it's a very natural human mm -hmm. thing to, mm -hmm. to, to seek to be with people like you. And um, we've also found that it's, it's, much healthier as a society when you try and step out and speak to people of different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, and to address your point about the United States as a melting pot, um, there's there's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not it is a melting pot and whether or not it should be a melting pot. Because to the the melting pot analogy kind of assumes everyone falls under the same culture and. Um, as, as I'm sure you guys don't want to lose your background, your heritage, your culture, other ethnicities and other people don't want to either. So there, there's been this idea that maybe America should be more like a tossed salad where it's a bunch of different groups all mixed together while they're maintaining their own identities. They're still creating a whole unique thing. Oh, it's right now with all the discussion about Muslim, that's a huge stereotyping. It's very, yeah. very, uh, very sensitive to that. They've, they've heard me say before, a person that worked with my father was a Muslim, a very high-ranking at the time Muslim, and was the epitome of everything you want to hear. was a kind, considerate, intelligent, everything, and, and to be have that person be lumped in with, with a negative 